Well, good morning, everybody. Good to see all of you here today. Hope you've enjoyed good weather this weekend. And uh, you Kentucky folks in here, love you. I'm smiling today. It's good to see all of you. No, I love picking on Kentucky folks, but uh, we love beating them in basketball when that happens, and it happens often. Um, anyway, uh, let me share with you, those of you who I'm kind of in the, in, the, in the spirit of competition this morning, let me share with you um, uh, something that shouldn't be a competition, but sometimes can, can be to me. It probably shows how weak I am and, and how sinful I am. Uh, but the angel tree. Uh, to this year, we supported Street Hope and particularly Garland Oaks, which is a, a home for people who have been rescued from, church, uh, from uh, sex slavery, uh, sex trafficking and uh for, for girls and we uh that was our project this year for um for angel tree and so we y'all did very well you did very well this year and you were very generous so i want to give uh let you see april timco who is the executive director for uh for uh for for street hope just she's got a message for us today Hello, Providence Church. I'm April Timko, Executive Director of Street Hope, Tennessee, and I want to thank you, Providence, for all of your sponsorship, participation in this past year's Trees of Hope. You were our largest fundraiser out of 17 sponsors, raising a total of nearly $13,000. So thank you so very much and congratulations for all the hard work you did. You are helping us provide therapy, groceries, and supplies for resident survivors at Garland Oaks who are currently experiencing healing and hope and restoration. So thank you so much for your ongoing partnership and may God bless each and every one of you in 2024. All right, that's a great, great job, y'all. And uh, that's why we do Angel Tree. It's not just something that is a tradition here at Providence. It certainly is. And most of you didn't know that there were other churches doing that as well. I actually didn't know that there were a whole lot of other churches doing it as well. But, man, they were blown away, and they are very thankful for your generosity. So I want to just thank you for that. And uh, those of y'all that are around next Christmas, if you're just here new with us, then you'll get to be a part of that next Christmas uh, as well. Uh, in the spirit of competition... Uh, man Day Night is coming, not tomorrow night, but next Monday night. And up here, you might be wondering what this is. 50-pound trophy. This is the coveted. I mean, there's the Super Bowl. I mean, there's the NCAA National Championship. But then there's the Man Day Night Chili Cook-Off. And uh, we'll have about, you know, 20 or 30 guys, you know. Uh, and I hope that if you're thinking about, if you want to be in a rare air of, of you know, coveted, uh, uh, competition, then you need to make your favorite chili and come to Monday night. Uh, and that's for men. This is our once a year thing. And, um, I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to compete this year. I'm, I'm the champion here this year. I'm retiring as champion. You get to, if you win, you get, you know, hot sauce. We got a chili cook off uh, apron. We've got hats, many, many more things, vacations to Maui. I'm, I'm just te teasing about that. <laughs> But you will, uh, we have a great time and we need guys to make chili because we'll have 200 guys here to, to eat chili. And so please, if you've got a good chili recipe, enter it. Uh, we'll give you details uh, and let you know. We'll communicate what those things are. Let me share with you some other things that are probably important as well. I don't know what could be more important than that, but here it is. Financial peace. Uh, for those of y'all that are really, uh, you know, you'd like to really get to, be, to understand uh, um, Financial discipleship, that's what we call it here. How can I serve God uh, in, in all areas of my life, including my finances? Um, it starts this week, and it's on Tuesday. Go to the app. Go to ProvInfo, which is at the top of the app. Click at the next page, top of the app, which is upcoming events. And there it is at the top, uh, financial piece. And, and sign up there and let us know if you're coming. If you've got questions, find Stacy, find me. We'll, we'll, we'll answer any questions that you have. On February the 18th, that's in two weeks, we've got family gathering, and that's for Providence members to come. We've got a potluck thing that we're going to do. We usually do this, and this year's theme is winter potluck. That's your comfort food. That's your warm, cozy food, whatever you like to eat. Bring it, share it with the rest of the Providence family. Uh, we do the Lord's Supper. You hear about what's going on in different aspects of Providence Church. Um, we pray together. It's an awesome time together, so make sure you know that two weeks that's coming. And then finally, today, teaching us uh, again uh, is a guy who I love so much. He's a new member of, of Providence, fairly new, and it's Matt Hurd. His wife, Jamie, is on staff in our student ministry. But Matt, uh, he, was a he was a pastor for 11 years, 
in, in uh, Palm Bay, Florida, before hearing about, uh, through John Wright, hearing about what we do here at Providence and planting churches. He wanted to be a part of that somehow, has by faith just come to live up here in the great white north, and they found out about that a couple of weeks ago uh, from Florida. And uh, we just love having the Herd family and love having Matt. And Matt's going to be leading us today as we continue our study in the book of, of Ephesians. And uh, so if, you've, if you're here with us new at Providence, just know we love walking through books of the Bible. And uh, we're going to continue to do that today and finishing out Ephesians chapter 1. Why don't we pray together and then let's worship together. Father, we love you so much. Thank you for, God, just the church family that we have, the community and the fellowship and the fun we can have together, just even in, in silly competitions like a chili cook-off. All of this, Lord, is, a, is what it means to be a part of your family, your community. We have been changed by you, and we have been brought into a new community. That's what we're reading about in Ephesians and Lord, I just ask that today you would help us, show us, show us yourself. Teach us how to pray. Teach us how to, how to understand you better. And Lord, we do pray that you would reveal yourself to us today. And we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Would y'all stand together with us? We're going to sing a song that we learned during the psalm series. This is a song that really walked its way all the way through the entire book of Psalms. But why are we starting out singing it today? Because today we are going to be hearing from the book of Ephesians about how we need our hearts enlightened. We heard last week about what kind of blessings God has given to those who are in Christ. And this is about what the blessed person looks like tree planted by streams of water and how by meditating on God's instruction day and night so that's where we're going to begin our day let's sing this together
wondrous things in your word. We need you. We look forward and we just, uh, we just give you ourselves and our attention right now. Thank you. Thank you in Christ. Amen. Y'all have a seat. Amen. Well, good morning. My name is Matt. And uh, as Chad said, we, my family and I moved from Florida back in July. And uh, that was a whirlwind. It's been exciting and scary at the same time, but we're acclimating uh, don't miss the mosquitoes of Florida. Um, don't miss the humidity. I've heard people say here that it's humid. I'm like, oh my goodness, you do not know what humidity is until you walk out at 6.30, 7 in the morning and you're just, by walking outside, you're already drenched in sweat. But um, the snow was beautiful. I really enjoyed that. It was so serene, but when it turned to ice, I don't think I've ever been that stressed driving on the highway before. Um, I learned that you can't break and steer at the same time. And so uh, adrenaline just pumping all the time while driving and uh, did not like that at all. But we're happy to be with, here with you. Uh, my wife is on staff here working as uh, admin with the youth ministry. And uh, we just love being a part of Providence, love the culture here, love that the Bible is valued here. Um, it does my heart wonders. I mean, my heart does somersaults when I hear our youngest daughter uh, come home after uh, children's ministry in the morning FX and she tells me about some attribute of God that she learned. And I mean, I just so thrilled at that. Or she mentions some word study that they did and I'm like, yes, this is, this is what it's all about. It's about the Bible, it's about God's word being lifted high. And so we're just so thankful to be in a church that, that values the scriptures. 
So uh, enough about me. Well, I guess there's a little bit more about me in my intro here. Uh, I love sourdough bread. Anybody here like sourdough bread? All right, so I started making sourdough bread about a year, year and a half ago. And uh, I, got, I, I would say fairly good at it. Um, there's nothing quite like just a nice slice of sourdough bread that's piping hot out of the oven. It's got that crisp outer shell. It's got the fluffy inside. And if you put some butter on that, it's, it's divine. I mean, it's just, it's dangerous too because you start to notice some changes around the midsection and you kind of have to cool it. But I mean, I was making like two loaves a day and we were just, just going through that stuff. And uh, one particular time, I made a loaf of sourdough bread and it, it looked magazine perfect, picture perfect. And uh, I was getting ready to bite into this and just enjoy it. And when I did, I noticed something. <laughs> I was taken back. It, it tasted rather bland. And uh, so I did some troubleshooting, uh, retraced my steps, and I came to the conclusion that I forgot an ingredient. I forgot salt, all right? And who would have known that just a few pinches of salt would make bread taste really, really good, or lacking salt would make it just taste really, really bad and have to throw it away. And so that got me to thinking about uh, my prayer time, uh, perhaps your prayer time as well, and asking that, is it possible that when it comes to prayer that we could be missing some ingredients that would take our prayer from being bland to being something that packs more of a punch? Prayer that's a lot more flavorful um, than, than it could be. So this leads me to our big question this morning. And I want us to think about as we, uh, we peruse through this text, and that's what ingredients could we be missing as we pray for each other? Are there, are there some ingredients that, that we need to add to our prayers for each other in this church, um, in your small group, and perhaps even in your family? And my hope is that by the end of the sermon, that if you see some ingredients here that we're gonna be looking at in just a moment that are missing in your prayer time, that you would resolve today to begin adding those, implementing those into your prayer time to make your prayer more impactful. As you're turning to Ephesians chapter one, I just wanna kind of set the stage for you here, give you a little recap. In verses three through 14, Paul blessed God for all the spiritual blessings that he has given to his people. He's chosen them, he's adopted them, he's redeemed them, he's sealed them, they have an inheritance, they have a guarantee for that future inheritance. And so here in this text that we're gonna look at, he moves from the rhythm of praising God into the rhythm of thanksgiving and intercession. And so as we observe Paul's prayer, we're gonna encounter certain ingredients that we might just be missing in our own prayer lives. So if you would, let's uh, pray together and ask the Holy Spirit to, to lead us and guide us through this text. Um, Holy Spirit, we acknowledge that, um, that we need you. We are dependent upon you, and we ask that you would illuminate our hearts and our minds uh, to your word. Um, help us to understand what we're holding in our hands this morning. We're holding um, in our hands the inspired word of God, and so help us not to take these words lightly. I pray that you would challenge each and every one of us to evaluate our own hearts, our own lives, our own prayer lives to see what could be lacking what, what could be uh, that we need to add in order to uh, spice things up a bit. So guide us into truth as your word says that you do, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. So my main points are gonna come in the form of questions this morning, and the first question is this. Are we missing the ingredient of celebration in our prayer time? Are we missing the ingredient of celebration? Let's look at verses 15 through 16. Paul says, for this reason, because I've heard of your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love toward all the saints, I do not cease to give thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. And so it's been a while since Paul has been in Ephesus. He's been through quite a lot since then, some, enduring some hardships, some trials, and now he is imprisoned in Rome where he is writing these, this letter to these believers in Ephesus. 
As he's in prison, a report comes to him about the welfare, the spiritual progress of these believers that he left behind so many years ago. And Paul's response is one of celebration. He's ecstatic. He can't stop giving thanks. In fact, that verb in verse 16, giving thanks, indicates an ongoing action. So this thanksgiving, this thankful heart that Paul has, this celebrative heart that he has, is not just like a one-time deal, but it's something that he is continually giving thanks for. And he's giving thanks as he's remembering the Ephesians in his prayers. There's a a personal tone in that phrase. Um, It kind of gives the impression that Paul is actually mentioning them by name to God, and I don't think that's too far-fetched because when you look at some of other, uh, Paul's other letters, you see like at the end of Romans, there's a list of names that he was telling people, hey, tell this person hello, tell that person hello. And so I don't think it's too far-fetched that Paul knows the names of these people that he's thinking about and that he's personally celebrating them before the Lord by name. And so what is he celebrating here? Let's, let's, let's look at the text. It says he's celebrating their faithfulness to Christ. Okay, that's number one. They're living for Jesus and they are loving all the saints. So, so they're faithful to Christ, they're living for Jesus and their love for the saints proves this. Didn't Jesus say in his word that uh, they will know you are my disciples by your love for one another? And so they're they're proving that they're disciples of Jesus Christ by their actions toward one another. They're loving each other, all right? No matter what ethnic background, no matter economic standing, no matter uh, similar interest or not, uh, they are loving each other the way that Christ has told them to love each other. A commentator and pastor John Stott said it well. He said, it's impossible to be in Christ and not find oneself drawn both to him in trust and to his people in love. So I think what Stott's getting at here is is how can it be said that one is faithful to Christ and not love the saints? And you can't say, well, I love Jesus, but I don't like his church. I love Jesus, but man, the people that go to church, I really can't stand. Listen, Jesus gave his life for the church. Who are we to say that we don't love the body of Christ? I think it really boils down to this. In in Christ, you lose the right to choose who you love. In Christ, you lose the right to choose who you love. A lot of us treat people like a buffet line. We're going through it and we're saying a little bit of that, that person's okay, this person is similar interest to me, this person is in a similar walk uh, that I'm in, but man, that person over there, no, I won't have any of that, thank you. Thank you very much. And so we avoid other saints, right? And I get it, we have our quirks. I have my quirks that are probably (laughs) annoying to people, but in Christ, we lose the right to choose whom we love. He calls us to love each other. He calls us to break down walls and barriers and to love each other the way that he has taught us to do. And so Paul is ecstatic that verses three through 14 are a reality in the lives of these Christians. They're living a life consistent with being chosen. They're living a life consistent with being adopted into God's family. They're living a life consistent with with people who are redeemed, who have been bought from slavery to sin. He's ecstatic. So let me ask you this question. What, What difference might it make in someone's life if you told them that you were celebrating their spiritual progress in your prayer time? Like, sometimes people don't see it, do they? Like, sometimes we walk around, we feel defeated, like, I just don't know if I'm making any progress or not. I feel like a loser. I feel like I'm not getting anywhere. I'm trying, but I just don't, I just don't see it. Imagine what it would do for that person, for someone to come up to them and say, hey, listen, the other day in my quiet time, I was celebrating you because I've seen your faithful service um, at Providence. Or hey, the other day I I was celebrating you before the Lord because um, I'm so excited that you've joined our small group and that you're plugged in here and getting to know us. 
Um, you know, I'm so excited because I see you discipling people here at Providence and you're investing in the lives of other people and you're, you're being obedient to Jesus and that just brings my heart so much joy. Imagine if, if you didn't just thank God for people in your prayer time, but you went and actually told them, hey, I'm, I'm thanking God for you. I'm celebrating the spiritual strides that I see you making in your life. I would imagine that would put some gas in somebody's spiritual tank to get by a little bit further down the road in their spiritual journey. They go, oh, somebody, somebody does see something. There, there is progress that's, that's being made. Imagine the impact of celebrating other believers in Christ. And that's what we're called to do as, as a part of this new community of faith, is the book of Ephesians is, is one of the big themes that's through it, is we're to cheer each other on. We're to celebrate one another. Unfortunately, um, we're often guilty of being better at celebrating the defeats of Christians in this new community. You know, you hear of big names of that maybe got into some kind of conundrum and they fell, they messed up, they made a bad choice in the ministry, and, and then you have those gotcha Christians that are like, gotcha, I knew it was gonna happen. I just knew you were a bad egg, and that shouldn't be the case. We shouldn't be celebrating spiritual defeats when those, things, those defeats do happen, we should be interceding for them in prayer and that God would uh, restore them, that God would um, just work and heal and mend that situation, not laugh at or mock at or celebrate those defeats. We're to be about cheering each other on. And so we certainly need to make sure that the ingredient of celebration for others, spiritual victories, is added in our prayer time. Secondly, we need to ask, are we missing the ingredient of more impactful intercession? How many of you are um, familiar with the average prayer list in a, in a church? If you've been in church for any length of time, are you familiar with the, the prayer sheet that comes out usually on a Wednesday night? And you, know, you gather around on a Wednesday night with just a few people and you pray through the list. Anybody familiar with that list through the years? You know what I'm talking about? Okay, please don't hear me knocking that list. I'm not making fun of it. I, I just wanna point out that perhaps we're missing some things off or from the list. That perhaps there's some things that needed to be added to that list that would make for more impactful prayer. You know, usually that list has um, categories on it. This week's requests, um, those that need salvation, those that are homebound or you know, can't get out, those that are invalid, uh, those that need health, you know, maybe people in the hospital or sick or, or you name it. There's usually a section for the military and praying for those that, that serve our country in that way. And then a section perhaps for missions or other organizations that the church supports. And, and those things are good things. God, I think God cares about those things on that list. But I'm wondering if maybe we should add things like praying for others to know Christ in a deeper way. Have you ever seen that on a prayer list at church? Praying for others to know Christ in a deeper way. Let's look at verse 17. Paul is praying here for the Ephesians and he's praying that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give you the spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of him. And so I think what we see Paul doing here is praying for these believers to know Christ more, to know Christ better. The word that he uses there for know refers to more than just facts. He's not praying that, hey, I just pray that you'll increase in your knowledge, factual knowledge of Jesus, although that's not a bad thing. I, I think we should strive after that and learn about him more and more from his word, but it refers to more of a personal knowledge. And Paul does something interesting with this word. He, he adds a prefix to it. He adds a preposition to the beginning of this word, which takes it from personal knowledge to something more impactful, something um, that's more intense. And he's praying for them to have an authentic, deep, relational knowledge of Christ. He's praying for them to know Jesus. He's praying for them to taste and see that the Lord is good just a little bit more each and every day. So, so why would this prayer be important for the Ephesians? 
because they were entrenched in a culture that was very familiar with the gods and goddesses, specifically their patron god, Artemis. And living in that kind of culture, they needed their relationship with Jesus to be strong, stronger than the cultural's pull upon them. So he's praying for them to know Christ deeper each and every day. Let me ask you this, is that not the best thing that you could possibly pray for somebody? Let's just, let's just think about that for a minute. Praying for somebody to know Jesus better, is that not like the best thing that you could pray for somebody? Think of how many things would work themselves out simply by that prayer being answered. Think about a person that struggles with, with anger, that the closer they get to Jesus and the closer they begin to look like him, don't you think that their issue with anger could start to kind of wane and subside? Don't you think a person that struggles with bitterness and criticism and, and greed and jealousy, that those things would start to iron out or start to kind of be shaved away the closer they got to Jesus in relationship with him? I think so many things could be figured out, could be taken care of simply by this request for a person to know Jesus better if it was answered in a person's life. Think about how this prayer for someone to grow deeper relationally with Jesus Christ could transform a family. Think of it, it, you know, think of it this way, if a dad got closer to Jesus, how that would change him as a husband, how that would change him as a dad to his kids. Think about how that would level him up. Think the same thing for a wife. How if she got closer to Jesus, like just the mother that she would be, the wife that she would be. Think about what that kind of marriage would be if both husband and wife are moving in the same direction, knowing Christ better each and every day. It would only bring them together. It would only make that family stronger. Think about how it would impact future generations to come. You know, guys, there's countless stories that you can read about where somebody in a family got saved and they got passionate about Jesus and that like changed the direction of the family tree for a long, long time. Guys, this prayer is so important and we need to add this prayer, this ingredient to our prayer time for people to know Jesus better. And that's my challenge to you. Start adding this ingredient to your prayer for other people. Start praying for your kids in this way that they'll know Jesus better. Don't stop praying for the list, okay? Pray for those things, Jesus cares for those things, but add this ingredient to it, and then you've got a recipe that's creating very, very flavorful prayer. So we should definitely add praying for each other to know Christ more. Next, we should add praying for others to have greater spiritual eyesight. Let's look at verse 18 having the eyes of your hearts enlightened, that you may know what is the hope to which you, he has called you. So in the ancient world, the heart was described as the center um, of the physical, spiritual, and mental life of a person. The eyes of the heart involve the whole inner life of an individual, including their emotions, their thinking, and their will. And so I believe what Paul is doing here is he's asking the Holy Spirit to give the Ephesians greater spiritual vision. He's asking for the Holy Spirit to give the Ephesians greater spiritual eyesight. So what greater spiritual eyesight is Paul praying for them to have? I think that we see here in the text greater spiritual eyesight concerning their hope. Do you see that there? He wants them to know the hope of their calling. He wants them to grasp a hold of that hope. And this takes us back to verses three through 14, where we see that their hope was grounded in God's choice of them before the foundations of the world. So what is this hope that Paul wants them to grasp a hold of? What is it, this hope that he wants them to really comprehend, to really apprehend? to belong to Christ and what that means, to really grasp on to the fact that they're his holy people, to grasp on to what the gospel means, that there is freedom in Christ from slavery to sin, to really grasp on to the hope of, of peace that you have in Jesus, 
grasp on to the hope of you've been given a, a guarantee for a future inheritance that far outweighs anything this world could ever offer you. Future glory. Hope that he's chosen them. Hope that he's adopted them. That they are now presently members of God's family. Hope that he's redeemed them. Hope that he's, he's sealed them forever. So, why is it important? Why does Paul think it's important for the Ephesians to have greater spiritual eyesight concerning this hope to which they've been called to that has its foundation in eternity past? Well, the Ephesian culture looked to magic for hope. Magic was such a huge thing in Ephesus. But magic, the gods, the goddesses, could not bring freedom from slavery to sin. Magic couldn't bring peace or future glory. Magic couldn't bring redemption. And so they needed to know that their hope wasn't in the power of Ephesus as a great city of Rome. Their hope was not in the magical practices that was so abundant in that city. Their hope was in Jesus. Paul wants them to grasp the gospel. So, so why is it important that we know the hope of our calling? Well, we live in a world that's confused of where hope comes from. We really do. We live in a world that thinks hope is gonna come from a political party. That's the truth. We live in a world where people think that hope is gonna come from scientific and technological advancement. A world that thinks hope will come from the government, a favorite team winning or, or living the American dream. That's where hope comes from. Weekly spiritual goosebumps. Guys, we need to pray this prayer for each other that we will really grasp on to the hope of our calling that's grounded in eternity past because it's too easy for Christians to fall into the trap of thinking that the foundation of their hope is something that they can do to merit salvation. Guys, we need to be reminded that it's all Jesus, that he is our hope and that there's nothing in this world that can offer any hope other than Christ. Let me ask you this, how, how solid do you think a person would be if they grasp the idea that they've been chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world? How solid do you think a person would be if they grasp on to the idea that they have been adopted into God's family and are presently a child of God? How solid would that person be? How solid do you think a saint would be if they really wrapped their minds around the fact that they have been redeemed, that they have been bought, not with precious metals or any kind of currency, but they've been bought with the precious blood of Jesus and that they've been redeemed from slavery to sin? How solid do you think a person would be if they really wrap their minds around the fact that they've been sealed by the Holy Spirit, that they've been guaranteed, been given a guarantee of future glory, a future inheritance. How would standing on this rock solid hope change things for them when the ground of this world gets a little shaky? You know what I'm talking about. If you've lived long enough, you know that there are days when literally the ground has just been shaky beneath your feet, when you've been swept off your feet, you've been tripped and, uh, by the things that happen to us and, 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 and things get a little shaky, they get a, they get a little, it gets tough, we go through storms, we get tossed about. How solid do you think a person would be if they grasped the hope of their calling when the winds of this world blow hard? And the waves of trial and hardship sweep over the bow of their boat. How solid do you think a person would be if they truly grasped the fact that they have an anchor in Jesus that goes so far back in time before the world and the universe were ever created? How solid would a person be if they realized that Christ is their anchor? I love that old hymn that talks about, it states, all, all other ground is sinking sand. Anything this world says can offer hope is nothing more than sinking sand. But Christ is the solid rock on which we stand. And 
Guys, that's where our hope needs to lie and that's what we need to be praying for other people is that they'll know their hope of their calling. So we definitely need to be praying for others to grasp onto the hope to which they've been called. Next, in Paul's prayer, we're challenged to pray that others would have greater spiritual eyesight concerning their future inheritance. Look at verse 18. Paul continues praying, and he's, he prays that they will know what are the glorious riches of his inheritance in the saints. And so, in keeping with the bounds of context of chapter one, it seems best to view this as Paul praying for the Ephesians to comprehend their future inheritance that they have in Christ. Paul's prayed that they understand their hope, which was grounded in eternity past, and now he's praying for them to comprehend their glorious inheritance that awaits them out in the future. So what's this inheritance like? I, I struggled with that question this week. Like, what, what is this inheritance like? And I think we just hit a brick wall when it comes to that, that we can only imagine that it's, it's like nothing we have ever seen here before, that it is so much better, it is so much more glorious that we, we just, we can only imagine. But I do know that Peter, in his letter, describes this inheritance as something that can never perish, it can never spoil, it can never fade. John, in his first letter, says, we will be like Jesus because we will see him just as he is. In Philippians, Paul says that our bodies will be transformed into the likeness of Christ's glorious body. So whatever it looks like, guys, it's gonna be beautiful. It's gonna be magnificent. It's gonna be wonderful. It's gonna be something you've never seen or experienced before. So why does Paul pray this for these believers? You have to understand that Ephesus was the capital of the wealthy province of Asia. It was a city of banking and commerce, and its location made it a huge and important commercial city. Structures like the Temple of Artemis, the Library of Celsus, and the Great Theater, and even marble streets uh, in some areas indicate the wealth of this city. And so I think that Paul wants them to comprehend the fact that their inheritance in Christ that awaits them in the future is far superior to anything the city of Ephesus could ever offer them in this world. Why do we need to pray this for each other? That we will comprehend our future glory. Why do we need to pray for each other that we will comprehend our future inheritance in Christ? And I think it's because we live in a culture that's very prosperous. The lure is strong, guys to live one's life striving after the wealth of this world, living our lives after the wealth of this world. Why? Because wealth's tangible, right? We can see the big homes, we can see the fancy cars, and we can see the comfort and status that those things bring, and so we strive for it. We give our lives for it. But are you familiar with the law of entropy? The law of entropy will slowly do its work. The estate will eventually be auctioned off. People will come and they will buy your things or take your things because you can't take it when you leave. The stuff you thought was so important will be taken to the dump and it will be incinerated and it will be forgotten forever. But if you're in Christ, you have an inheritance that is far superior to anything this world could ever offer you, and it's never gonna fade away. It's never gonna spoil. It's never gonna go bad. It's forever. And we need to be praying for each other to understand, hey guys, this right here, this isn't it. This, this, isn't, this is not what it's all about. There is something so much greater ahead. So we need to pray this just as, for each other, just as Paul prayed this same prayer for the Ephesians. We also need to pray for greater spiritual eyesight concerning God's power and Christ's lordship. Look at verses 19 through 23. 
Paul continues his prayer and he's praying that they'll know what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe. According to the working of his great might, that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly places, far above all rule and authority and power and dominion and above every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And he put all things under his feet and gave him as head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Guys, that little section could be a sermon in and of itself. And let me tell you, it was so hard just to like not be bogged down with details. And so um, here Paul is praying for his readers to understand God's power toward them. That this power of God is available for you for living. So he reminds them of the hope of their calling, grounded in eternity past. He reminds them of a glorious future inheritance that they have in Jesus. And now he reminds them of God's power as a resource available presently for them in between those two bookends to live life for Christ now. And Paul describes this power as immeasurable. That's a word that only Paul uses in the scriptures. Only Paul uses that word. And three times he uses it in the book of Ephesians. And it's a word that means extreme, supreme, to be far more, to surpass, to go beyond all comprehension. Paul is saying you can't even fathom God's power. And then he goes on to use four synonymous Greek words to continue describing God's power. It's as if Paul gets out his thesaurus and just is exhausting his vocabulary and describing the power of this great God that is available for us to live in the here and now for him. It, it, there's no word in, our, in any language that could describe this kind of power. And so Paul gives examples of, of God's power that's available for believers now. And it's the same power involved in Christ's resurrection. Isn't that incredible? The same power that raised Jesus from the grave is available for you to live for Christ now. And that's important to grasp onto, don't you think? It's the same power that exalted Jesus to the highest honor, to the right hand of the Father. A place that he goes on to describe as a place above all rule, whether earthly powers or dark spiritual forces, a place of honor that's above every name, not just in the present, but their future as well. A place of honor where everything, everything is subject to the lordship of Jesus Christ. Every power, every rule, every name is inferior to the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants this church in Ephesus to, to have their eyes open to the fact that Jesus is head, not just over all things, but he is head over the church in Ephesus, and that they are his body, his tangible expression in the world. In other words, they're the hands and feet of Jesus in this world. So why would this be an important prayer for those in Ephesus? Well, power is a big deal for those in Ephesus, specifically spiritual power. Ephesus was known for its social power, it was known for its civic power, it was a place of imperial influence in that particular time and a place of religious power. Ephesus had no lack of cults and beliefs that focused on power. Their history was filled with seeking spiritual power through magical practices. Magic and power to make things happen in the world. Magic and power to influence others as well as events. Power and magic to even bring down your enemies. They lived in a city where invoking certain names was a means for harnessing magical power in service of spiritual beings. They lived in a culture that viewed Artemis as the most wonderful and powerful. And so here Paul describes that God's power is beyond any power associated with some god or goddess Paul is telling the Ephesians that God's power surpasses political power, powerful people, or the gods and goddesses that they worshiped. They needed to know that Jesus has no rival. Guys, do you understand that? Do you understand that Jesus, our Lord, has no 
rival. Jesus is far above, not just a little bit above, all rule, all authority, all power, all dominion. He's above every name that is named, not just now, but forever. Paul is telling the Ephesians, Artemis is not the greatest name, guys. Artemis is not, not the greatest name. Jesus is. Artemis doesn't even come close. Paul's assuring these believers that they don't need to worry themselves with discerning the names of spiritual entities or concern themselves that some being may rival Christ in power and authority. They didn't have to fear somebody coming up with some magical incantation to, to ruin their life because that power was subject to the power of Jesus Christ. In other words, Paul is saying Christ reigns supreme and every possible power in the universe in this world is inferior to and swallowed up by the mighty Lord Jesus Christ. Guys, I hope you see that in this text. I hope you see how grand and glorious that Jesus is how wonderful he is, how mighty he is. So why does the church today need to grasp this? Guys, the church needs to know, you need to know that there's absolutely nothing to fear. There is nothing to fear. There is nothing that can defeat the mission of the church. Nothing. No government, no human institution, no worldview, no argument, no cultural winds that blow here and there, no spiritual darkness can defeat the mission of the church with Christ as her head. The superior one, the name above all names, the one that's been exalted to the highest honor, the one that's above every name, not only in this age, but the one to come. With him as our head, what, what power could possibly stop the church? We need this prayer for each other because we need to know there's power, power available today not to help us work ourselves up into some kind of a frenzy and have some sort of a static experience, but, but power to help put secret sins to death. Did you know that? I mean, we all struggle with sins and, and some we're probably open about with others. There's others that we hold down deep inside and we never share. But did you know that there's power for you in Christ to put those secret sins to death? There's power to become people of prayer. There's power to practice spiritual disciplines. There's power for you to share the gospel. No matter how nervous you get, there's power available for you to share the gospel with people. There's power for you to be salt and light in this dark world. There is power available to you in Christ to go and make disciples, power to influence culture. Guys, this is why we need to pray these kinds of prayers for each other because we need to comprehend the power of God that is available for us now to live for Jesus in this world. So since all powers in this world and universe are inferior to Jesus, and Jesus is the head of the church, why does it seem like the church so often has a defeatist mentality? Like the greatest and best of all beings, the supreme one, the superior one is our head. Why would we ever have a defeatist mentality? Didn't Jesus say all power has been given to me? Therefore, go make disciples of all nations. And so if that power is backing us, behind us to go make disciples, then we need to pray for the saints of the church to realize this, to comprehend this, to really grab a hold of this so that they can go take the world for Jesus. Because God wants the world. And power is available for that to happen, for the church to make an impact in this world for the Lord. Impact the music industry for Jesus impact the medical industry for Jesus, power to impact the science and art world for Jesus, the education world of academia for Jesus. 
Guys, the one who has all power and is head of all things wants the world. So let's pray for each other to grasp this power so that we can go get the world. Does that sound like something that would be wonderful to do? Wonderful to grasp a hold of? I think so. So back to our big question, what ingredients do we need to add to our prayers? And if I could summarize this entire sermon in one just simple statement, it would be this. Here's the answer. Celebrate the spiritual victories of others and intercede for bigger things. Celebrate the spiritual victories of others and intercede for bigger things. Easy enough, right? But why is it that we don't celebrate the spiritual victories of others? I got, I got to thinking about this as I was writing this sermon. Why don't I celebrate the spiritual victories of others? Why is it that we're better at celebrating spiritual defeats? Why is it that when we hear somebody else getting accolades for something they've done for the Lord, that there's something within us that gets rubbed the wrong way? Jealousy and envy and competitive spirit. What inward heart issues keep us from rejoicing in thankfulness that others are making spiritual progress? Is it because we feel superior down deep inside? Why do we feel superior? Is it because self sits on the throne of our hearts? You see, self-righteous people can't afford to be happy for others because it redirects praise from themselves to other people. People who feel superior don't understand the gospel because the gospel shows our sin and our need for a savior. The gospel humbles us. The gospel is the opposite of self-righteous superiority. And I think ultimately the reason we don't celebrate the spiritual victories of others is because of idolatry. When self is is on the throne, we scramble for things like attention and approval, all for the purpose of not serving God, but ourselves. Idolatry is the issue because being celebrated is more fundamental to one's happiness than seeing God glorified through the spiritual victories of other people. Why don't we intercede in bigger ways like we've seen in this text? Why is it that most of our prayer time is just, looks like a list of just, stuff. Why aren't we praying for people to know Jesus better, to know the hope of their calling, to know their inheritance that awaits them, to know the power available to live for Jesus now? Why aren't we including those things in our prayer time? Is it because we view the temporal and comfortable as the most important things? Hey, as long as my daily needs are met and I'm comfortable, man, that's all that matters. Maybe we have a misguided view of a believer's greatest need. A misguided view that felt needs being answered in a person's life will bring their heart the answers, the peace, the freedom, and the joy that they have been looking for and longing for. But you and I both know that the temporal fades along with the peace and freedom that we thought it would bring. And the things that we thought would bring other people comfort ultimately no longer do. So how does Jesus solve the problem of our refusal to celebrate? I think one key component of the gospel is that it declares Jesus not only as our savior, but also as our Lord. And so the fact that Jesus is above every name and power dethrones us, self, and reminds us that everything revolves around Jesus. And so when we understand this, when we understand that he is supreme, that he is the name above all names, and that we are not, we're humbled. Who are we to refuse? We realize, who are we to refuse the king's work in someone else's life? When we wrap our minds around the fact that Jesus is Lord, we want him to be glorified, not ourselves. God becomes the center of everything we want and do. And and when this happens, we rejoice when others glorify God with their lives. And we pray for further spiritual victories in their lives as well. That's how Jesus solves the issue of self being on the throne. He's Lord and we're not. 
who are we not to celebrate his work in someone else's life? How does Jesus solve the issue of our lapses into thinking that the temporal and comfortable are the most important things to pray for? Guys, Jesus is the source of peace. Jesus is the source of freedom. Jesus is the source of joy. He's the one that gives us hope. He's the one in whom we have a new identity that is acceptable to the Father. And he achieved this by taking our sin upon himself. And so guys, when we taste and see that Christ is the only one that can truly bring us, bring our hearts, rest, peace, freedom, and joy, then we don't stop praying for the temporal. We don't stop praying for those things that make us comfortable, but we add praying for these bigger things too. We add some more ingredients to make for more flavorful prayer. We pray for the saints to know him deeper. We pray for the saints to lay on to the hope, uh, lay hold of the hope that they've been called to. We pray for the saints to realize their future inheritance and to apprehend the power of God that is available for them to live now. Guys, um, if a little bit of salt can radically alter the taste of sourdough bread, think of what adding the ingredients of celebrating the spiritual victories of others and praying for bigger things can do within the community of faith. This time, Brian is gonna come and he's gonna guide us through some application of this passage. So it's good to take a little bit of time. We've been challenged with, well, what is the challenge for me, for sure? The challenge of praying differently praying differently for others, imitating the example of Paul in this passage, thinking about what matters eternally, not just what matters in the immediate moment where we are. Do you think that when the Ephesians received this letter from Paul and they read this part about how he's praying all the time, that they would have their heart's eyes enlightened and they would grasp their hope and their inheritance, that they would understand his power. Do you think when they read that, that that felt deeply moving and deeply changing to them? I think it probably did. I think they thought, yeah, we need to pray this way for each other. And you know what? I think think they probably went, we need to pray this way for ourselves. This is what Paul's praying for us. This is probably what we should be wanting, right? That's been my conviction this week, spending time in this passage. And so I want to invite you to just take a minute, just some stillness. You can close your eyes. You can um, take what posture fits prayer for you. But just allow yourself to um, listen to what he has said to you, what God has said to you through, through Paul, through this letter, through this passage this morning. Who do you need to pray for? Who's the name that he brings to mind where you say, I need to, I need to celebrate and be thankful for the spiritual victories in this person's life. Let's be still a moment. Ask him that. And really, like, take the time. Celebrate it. Thank him. Ask him to show you who you know who needs to know him more. 
whose life would be turned around, whose struggle would be given meaning if they knew this hope, if they knew who he is. Maybe someone you know who doesn't know him at all or somebody who does, but they're struggling to remember that they've got this inheritance in him. Who is that for you? Bring them before the Lord right now. team is going to make their way up here um, to lead us in some more singing together. And as they do, y'all can stand. I just want to lead us in a prayer of response to what we've heard. Y'all can get to your feet. Y'all pray with me. What I ask for, God, is that for us, not just for somebody else, but for each one of us to look at ourselves and ask this, that you would open the eyes of our hearts, that you would let us really grasp the hope that we have in you, the inheritance that we await, that turns everything in this world that we look to for value into nothing because we have one unchangeable inheritance and it is you. It's not our money, it's not our friend situation, it's not our marriage situation. It's not whatever we're working on that we hope to be successful in right now. That can come or go. If we have you, that cannot take our hope hope is in you. Our value is in you. It is fixed. It is set because you purchased it for us with your blood, Jesus. Lead us. Lead our hearts to the right place here. We can't lead our own hearts. We need your spirit to do it. we sing these words together. Let us believe them. I'm going to sing this out. My worth is not in what I am. Sing this with me. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love.
Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. May our incense rise. Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never ending praise. May our incense arise. Let us bless the Lord every day and night, never.
listen real quick. Turn that off. If you're a small group leader, there's a little thing happening. Kickoff right after this service, just over here in the study. Small group leaders, hop on over there, say hello, learn some stuff about small groups and what's happening this semester. Everybody else, have a great week. Love you guys. See you next time. Bye.